Hey, it's Mark Podolsky, The Land Geek, with your favorite niche real estate website, www.thelandgeek.com. And I'm really excited for today's podcast guest um, for a number of reasons, but I'd be remiss if I didn't properly introduce my co-host, Six Sigma. You know him. You love him. The automation guru himself, Scott Todd from scotttodd.net landmoto.com and most importantly if not automating your craigslist postings postingdomination.com forward slash the land geek and by the way you can automate your uh, facebook postings as well uh today's podcast is sponsored by geekpay.io the only set it and forget it automated financial crm to manage your borrowers payments today's guest is really pretty cool guy he does a lot Scott Allen Turner went from a money moron at age 22 to self-made millionaire 13 years later by using uh, a number of savvy financial ideas. Um, He's basically a financial rock star and you can see the, well, you can't see it, but Scott and I can see it. He's got a guitar in the back there. Scott Allen Turner as featured on Forbes, US News, Business Insider Money. How are you? I'm doing awesome. Thank you guys for having me on. Um, tell us about your, your money moron days and how you got out of it. Sure thing. I grew up not getting a good financial education, which I guess would say pretty common for most people. Didn't learn a lot from my parents, didn't learn it from high school, college, got out of college, had some student loan debt, got into some credit card debt, got into a auto payment, not knowing anything about interest rates or getting insurance from a car. So I had a lot of, a lot of debt coming out of school and that went on for a number of years got into too much house at the recommendation of one of my bosses. He said, buy as much house as the bank will let you, which I almost did. <laughs> and then in my mid twenties, I got my financial awakening from a guy named Clark Howard. He's a syndicated radio host back in Atlanta. Started listening to him a lot, picking up on his tips and made that switch from being a money moron now to um, being better at money. We'll say, <laughs> well, that's, that's incredible. Um, so you're a self-made millionaire. How did you make your money? There, I have an IT background. I came from the corporate world, worked for a couple of startup companies, then grew uh, in employment there, got raises. From there, branched out on my own, started a, a business with some guys that approached me. So for me, it was getting the corporate world, got a late start in marriage with kids. So if you're single and not blowing all your money, you can put away a little bit. <laughs> and then getting into investing, passive investing, index funds. I lost a lot of money in the stock market. So that was in money moron days, uh, investing the the wrong way. And entrepreneurship has been a part of it, but really budgeting, saving, and living a somewhat frugal life in other aspects has helped as well. Phenomenal. Scott Todd, what are your thoughts about this financial rock star? I mean, you know, obviously he's done something, right? You know, like I can't really... uh... Can't, can't really like poke holes in them. I would just say that I must have missed the class in high school where they talked about money management as well because I don't see it anywhere. My, my children aren't going through it. It's really something that you have to teach at home. And, um, you know, I would think that we, we would have a change by now, don't you think? Yeah, well, Scott, Alan Turner, why are we so deprived of a good financial education for our children? <laughs> Do you want to get into just government education, period? By <laughs> uh, at least here in America, we're teaching to a test. I mean, if you want to go down to the root level, we're not spending time on how to balance a checkbook, how to go out and get an auto loan, the pros and cons of credit card use and all this stuff, how to get a mortgage. Instead, we want to go through and teach vocabulary for SAT words that you're never going to use in life. And teaching to a test is what it comes down to. Teachers have their hands tied. Uh, unfortunately, they do as good of a job as they can, but it all stems back to uh, them. And then also, it's parents' involvement. What did you learn from your parents? For me, I learned how to save. They said save, but my parents never owned a home. They rented their entire lives. My dad had a pension. My mom didn't have any type of work at a coffee shop uh, most of her life or in the laundromat. They didn't have car loans, so they couldn't teach me about interest. They didn't have student loans. They didn't go to college and all those things you would hope you could learn from your elders. We didn't get it. Sure, sure. Um, You know, 
what about a uh i mean what about like an abundance mentality versus a scarcity mentality um did your parents have that is what i mean did they have an abundance mentality or did you hear growing up money doesn't grow on trees um you know that kind of thing it wasn't necessarily abundance they lived a very i grew up in a small town two thousand people they lived a very simple life my dad worked for the town i mean they had my mom still in that town she never travels she has had the same friends for going on 65 years now she's almost 80 and so that i think that environment of not having a lot of wants not having a lot of needs having lower incomes not going to college and getting a higher education contributed to a very simple lifestyle which i picked up on some of that but then as soon as i get away at home it's like all right i want to spend 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 now that i can uh, right right so tell us about the 99 minute millionaire in your book yeah absolutely I host my own show, the Scott Allen Turner Show, and I answer listener questions on there from anything from how to get started starting a business, beginning investing, beginning budgeting, earning more. And one of the most common questions I kept hearing over and over again is how do I get started investing? Uh, what do I do with that? And that came down to, I don't know what a stock is. I don't know what a bond is. What is the market and all these different terms. So I tasked myself, I wanna teach someone who knows absolutely nothing about investing why you should invest, even down to why the compounding power of money, taking that over time, in 99 minutes, take them from, I don't know, any of that stuff to you're a beginning investor and you're investing the smart way. So what is the smart way to invest? For me, I'm what I call a boring investor after losing $40,000 in the stock market, picking high flyers like Yahoo, Cisco, Home Depot, some biotech technology companies I knew absolutely nothing about. Then I got into index funds, low cost, the Vanguard philosophy, buy and hold, buying all the market. So that's my investing philosophy that I follow and I teach. And that's based on academic research. It's based on guys who have PhDs, Nobel Prize, or won the Nobel Prize in economics. Guys who, they're not out to make money. They're just like, here's a research paper. I've done all this data crunching. And here's what I think is the right investing philosophy. It works most of the time if you follow this philosophy compared to what I used to do, trying to time the market, pick companies I knew nothing about and all that stuff. So that's kind of what I try to teach people. What, what do you believe about personal finance that other people think is crazy? For me, I do what I like to call value-based spending. Some people, there's two different camps. Some people will say, don't ever have a Starbucks and it's five bucks a day. And if you just didn't spend that money, you'd have a million dollars in 30 years. And then there's other people say, forget about the Starbucks. Don't pay attention to spending all go out and make another 20, 30 grand a year. And that'll get you where you want to go. What I found is you can never out earn poor spending habits. So if you can recognize what makes me happy, what is the value I put into my different purchases and track those very simply and direct your money towards things that are important to you. In my own life, I like spending money on vacation, I like money, uh, spending money on going out to eat really nice meals occasionally. I don't care much about clothes. Those of you, well, you guys can see me. <laughs> I got a t-shirt on. This is my standard uh, fare for uh, most days of the week, shorts, t-shirt. And so I don't spend a lot of that money on that area of my life, but I direct it to others. And that's why I try to teach people, find out what you want, what makes you happy, put the money there, cut back on the things that don't, and then you can come out ahead. Scott Todd, what are your thoughts? Well, I mean, I, I, do, I do kind of like lean towards the, the school of thought of like, like if, I, if I want a drink from, uh, from Starbucks, you know, my, my problem is, would probably be a, um, an income problem more so than, a, than an expense problem. But if I'm, if I'm just out buying everything and buying every, you know, going to Starbucks and saying, hey, everybody, drinks are on me today. Well, that's the, the fastest way to the poorhouse, right? And I, I, I do agree in a hybrid approach like what you're saying is if something brings value or joy to you, then there's nothing wrong with it. You know, like if, if Starbucks is what brings joy to your day, you know, and, and you have the $5, great, go, go do it. But I think that you can solve a lot of problems by generating more revenue. Uh, more so than you can, I mean, you can get rich, in my opinion, you can get rich quicker by generating more revenue than you can by skipping the Starbucks, right? Yeah, I, I think that um, if you want to, you know, really find out what's important in your life, 
look at your credit card bill and see what you're spending your money on. Um, because that'll tell you exactly what's really important in your life. Then you can look back and be like, wait, is this really what I value? Or is this just, am I just on autopilot? And so I think the, you know, what Scott's making an argument about is being conscious of what you're really, where you're putting your money. So he's making a conscious choice that, hey, look, vacation is important to me. But vacation's probably not that important to him. It's probably spending time with his family in a relaxed environment. That's really what's important. You know, it's probably not a fancy foodie meal. It's probably spending time with his family, you know, in, in an environment where, um, you know, they're having an interesting sort of uh, gastronomic experience, if you will. So experiences is where Scott is saying, hey, this is where I want to put my money. Yeah. And, um, and I, I guess I don't want to put words in your mouth, Scott, but I, I, I think you're, Scott, you're kind of making the argument that, um, that, you know, it doesn't matter how much money you make if you're not conscious of the, where your money's going. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Paula Pant, she has her own show and she's got a good quote. You can afford anything. You just can't afford everything. And we live in a very consumer oriented society. And don't get me wrong. I love stuff. I love buying stuff. I mean, <laughs> stuff in the background that I got. <laughs> so, but I'm also aware of, I can't afford everything. So I try to prioritize. And since most people, half of people in their mid forties have no money saved towards retirement, They've obviously spent a lot of money, which I did early on until I changed that mentality. And when you start recognizing, all right, I'm spending every dollar and a lot of people carry credit card debt, so they're spending more than their income allows. It's a bad place when retirement door approaches and you haven't saved anything. Scott, let me ask you a question just to pivot a little bit. What, what is your, I mean, because you went through corporate environment. You, you went through like, I hit what, like four rounds of layoff at, layoffs at your company that you survived, right? Yes. Um, you saw an IT staff dwindle from 50 jobs down to four. You know, uh, most recently I heard like Lowe's. I, I worked in IT as well. Okay, like when I left my corporate job, I, I was a VP of IT for a Fortune 300 company. Uh, you see even, even IT jobs, like, you know, these in-demand jobs that, you see them getting outsourced more and more and more. What is your thought about the safety around the corporate job? Myth? Is it real? What do you think? I think it's a myth. There is no such thing as job security unless you're the owner of the company and you don't have to report to a board because then you're not going to get fired. You're not going to fire yourself. <laughs> Everyone has to be acutely aware of that in no matter what industry that you're in. Especially in those industries that are the writing is on the wall. If you were making Blu-ray players years ago, all right, everything's going to internet, going to be streamed. You can kind of see that your job is going to go away. Uh, we're all about uh, Tesla stock right now and self-driving automated cars. So if you're in the auto industry and start thinking about that, well, maybe 10, 15, 20 years, somewhere down the road, the entire auto industry is going to look a lot different than it does today. The writing is on the wall and that's something that people need to be prepared so I'm a firm believer there's no such thing as a job security, but man, if you are a rock star employee, you've kept up with your education, you're a good worker, you get along with your coworkers, the opportunities are always going to be there for great employees. Maybe not necessarily at that company, but somewhere else. Scott, if I had to, you know, give you, put you on a desert island and besides your own book, and you can only have one personal finance book, right? And you're on the island for like, three months, let's say, and you had to read it over and over again, over again, and really, really take everything kind of to heart. What personal finance book would you pick and why? My favorite one is called The Millionaire Next Door. It was written by a guy from Georgia, Georgia, well, the University of Georgia, years ago. It's about 20 years old, I think. And he went out and had this perception of what is a millionaire? And it's normally what Hollywood makes it out to be. All right, they're wearing fancy clothes, Rolex watches, uh, awesome Louis Vuitton purses, drinking Grey Goose all the time. He went out and rounded them all up across the United States, got them in a room and started figuring out what are these guys really like? Oh, they're drinking Budweiser. They rarely buy expensive wines, normally 10 or 20 bucks. They've got blue jeans on, polo shirts. They're just they're the millionaire next door. You'd never know who's who these guys are. They didn't inherit their money is a big thing. We think... 
rich people, they get all the breaks. They've got all their money from their parents. No, it's about 8% of millionaires have inherited some type of money from uh, their parents. They budget a lot. I think 60, maybe 80% of millionaires budgeted and they budgeted to become millionaires. They didn't start budgeting after they became millionaires. And they drive used cars, they're not out in Mercedes. I mean, this guy broke down, what are they driving? What percentage of these people are driving trucks versus Mercedes or BMW or used cars? They don't lease cars. And it's an eye opener because it gives you this whole new outlook on, here's how you build wealth. And that's essentially what the book is about. You don't consume every dollar or more than every dollar you save, and then you can become that millionaire if that's one of your goals in life. Yeah, I love it. I had somebody on the podcast. He said, Mark, if you, if you know, my rule of thumb is if you want a car, right, then it should be uh, 1% of your gross income. So if you want a BMW, make $500,000 a year, right? Great. Go get your car, right? Um, but otherwise, it's like, you know, it's, it's like one of the worst money eating things, uh, on the planet. Um, what do you, what would you say about, you know, the future of investing? Because now today more than ever, uh, we have artificial intelligence. So I can buy an index fund, but I could buy a fund of funds and I can have something like Betterment, just robo sort of invest for me. Um, is this a good idea or would you say maybe talk to a human being about it still? I think if you're just getting started, robo advisors are a great opportunity. I like Betterment, Acorns, I think Clink is another one. And all three of those, and there's some other ones as well. Vanguard, one of the big brokerage houses has their own stuff. But they're all, again, based on that academic philosophy of buying a little bit of everything, low cost, proper risk tolerance for whatever your investment horizon is. And I think that's a great place to start. As you start accumulating more, getting closer towards retirement, your family situation changes, your wealth situation increases, that introduces a lot of more complexity. It's, you have to start asking the question, am I gonna have enough for retirement? And the question is, well, I don't know. So <laughs> sitting down with somebody at that point, trying to figure out 10, 20, even 25 years ahead of whatever your projected retirement date is, can be very helpful because they can run all the simulations. Here's your saving rate. Here's what your expenditures are. Here's how we think you're going to live. My wife and I talk about this quite frequently. It freaks people out. It's like, uh, what, how long are you going? How long are you going to live? Uh, when are you going to die? What happens if I die? Are you going to get married or not? What's going to happen with the kids? Uh, those are conversations that are normal in our house, but a lot of people treat them as no. I don't want to talk about dying or anything like that. Well, sorry to say, you're going to die. Everybody's going to die. So you must talk about it and get it out there in the open and start planning for it. So I think getting started to answer your question, yeah, robots are great. Moving on down the line as you accumulate more wealth, a human can help you out and help you maximize your investments. All right. I love it. Um, what is the most frequently asked question you get on the podcast? Probably number one is how do I get out of debt is the first one. And number two was the basis of the book, how do I get started in, uh, investing? So how do I get out of debt? That gets back into having a spending plan, writing down where's your money going so that you can direct whatever free money is left over towards paying down the debts as quickly as possible. If you've got high interest credit cards, high interest car loans, student loans, paying those off has a guaranteed rate of return compared to investing in the stock market, even though it's flying high right now and it has been for a while, uh, that's going to come down and it'll come down to reality or negative. So the return may not be there like you can get with paying off a uh, 12% credit card. Yeah, absolutely. Scott Todd, have you ever been in debt, like consumer debt? Uh, credit, credit cards? Yeah, I've had credit cards. You had credit card debt? Yeah, yeah. Um, on stuff? I can't imagine you having real debt. No, no, no. I, yeah, stuff. Like, you know, I, I um, Mark, I had to, uh, to move twice in my corporate job. And sometimes uh, in, in doing so, you'd put the stuff on the credit card just so you can buy the house, right? You know, you move into a house and man, you got to furnish the house. And, you know, I had to do that twice. And, you know, yeah, you take, you take your stuff with you, but still there, you know, the, the house, like my last house in, uh, in 
in, down in uh, Southwest Florida, you know, like it, it was a larger house than what we had. Uh, it was in a completely different area. We needed things in order to, to even live there because it was a brand new house, blinds, et cetera. So, you know, that's a, a huge expense all at one time. I mean, you, you know, you've moved into a house and uh, so s- some of that stuff gets added up, but then you've got to attack it uh, very quickly too. Yeah. I like the, the Dave Ramsey approach of, of debt um, where you just like the easiest thing, right? It's like, it's called the, what is it, the avalanche effect? Is that what it's called? Snowball. The snowball, snowball effect. Yeah. 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 You like that, Scott? I think it works for the vast majority of people. There's been a lot of studies on it. There's some math people out there, which I've had right in my show with actual examples and the paying off the higher interest loans first saved them money and got them out of debt quicker than what they would have done if they paid off the lower balance credit cards and worked through that way. So it's very situation dependent. It's very personal, whether you're going to exceed it one plan or the other. But overall, yeah, the debt snowball works for the vast majority of people compared to paying off a $50,000 student loan at 8% and then you've got a $10,000 car loan at 3%. Yeah, I mean, you know, education is becoming an almost untenable debt, right? It's the only debt you can't get rid of. Um, and you can make the argument the return on investment is lousy um, unless, I guess, you're going to become a plastic surgeon or uh, you know, something, you know, real high earning, but let's say that, uh, you're going to get a liberal arts degree, right? Um, what would you say to that kid that, that wants to, you know, go to college and, and study, you know, uh, liberal arts? Yeah. For somebody who's just thinking about getting started, hopefully the planned out, all right, I want to get this degree. Here's what I'm going to do with it. Collegescorecard.com. You can go to that particular website, type in, here's where I want to go to school. Here's what I want to graduate with. And here's what my potential earning is based on that specific degree coming out of that specific school. And you can get an idea of, all right, it's going to pay or take me uh, 60 years to make this back. That's obviously not a good investment. But for somebody else, all right, we're paying $10,000 a year for four years. They're going to come out and be making 35, 40 grand, more reasonable. Certainly starting out at community college is a way to cut down on costs. I've had relatives that were in their senior year of high school and they would knock out some of those core college classes that could then transfer. So they end up starting in their sophomore year at college just by doing college courses in high school. Yeah, I mean, Scott, do you ever see a time where – the degree won't ever matter. Um, you know, you can go on iTunes right now and take a Stanford class. You can go on lynda.com and learn how to do almost anything. I mean, today, education's abundant. Uh, why do I need a degree? Do I still need a degree? <laughs> it depends on who you ask. In the corporate world, Fortune 500 companies, a lot of them, they're still in that old mindset. My wife went to school, get her master's degree, she got her MBA because that was necessary for her career path. She wanted to get commercial real estate development. I had a friend who had to get his, well, he wanted to be in finance. It's one of the check boxes on the resumes and the HR. Do you have your MBA? Yes, I've got this piece of paper. Nobody cares what your GPA is. Nobody cares what your school is. It's just the check box thing. And a lot of people still have that mentality. If you talk to entrepreneurs and serial or small business owners, they're like, I don't care what your degree is. If you can come here and do the job, it's yours. Yeah. Yeah. Scott Todd, does uh, the cost of education bother you? Yeah, I think it's, uh, I, I think it's extremely high. I read an article the other day that said that, um, you know, economists, if you will, are, are saying that in, in 10 years, education will be free, that the biggest, the biggest uh, kind of resistance to that will be the, the universities who will scoff at the idea that you can get an education for free. But, you know, you're seeing there are signs out there that major employers, Ernst & Young, a very big accounting firm, for example, uh, in 2015 basically said that they would not require a college degree as an entry requirement to their firm. You know, so I think that as companies begin to become aware that there's a lot of talent that you you can have even though you don't have a college degree, when companies realize this, they're going to start to remove that barrier. And they're, the companies, I think that the companies that do that will probably be the companies that 
that rise to the top because there's a lot of untapped talent out there that don't have college degrees. However, it doesn't mean that they're not very intelligent. I mean, I've seen people with, with college degrees. You guys know, know people like this. They're, they've got college degrees and they're like blank, you know, like you, you, you can't even have a conversation with them. Then you take someone who may, maybe barely even, I mean, like I'll, uh, you know, my, my father-in-law, for example, uh, and my dad too, they, both of them, neither one of them went to college. However, they are very strong self-taught men who basically they will study a, a manual and they will, they will plow down until they're successful. That's the kind of people that I think that you really want. Yeah, absolutely. So Scott, Alan Turner, before we uh, get to the tip of the week, any last words of wisdom for us as far as personal finance is concerned? Yeah, since we were talking about robo-advisors earlier, I'd just like to encourage anybody who has not started investing yet to check out one of those options. You can get started investing with as little as a couple bucks in 10 minutes and start your way onto building wealth over the long term. All right, I love it. All right, well now we're gonna put you on the spot and ask you for your tip of the week, a website, a resource, a book, something actionable where the art of passive income listeners can go right now, improve their businesses, improve their lives. What have you got? Yeah, I've just started using this new tool called Boomerang for email. I don't know if you guys have heard it or not of it. Love Boomerang. Although I will, I'm going to save you some money when we're after your tip, though. I, I love that application because when I'm answering listener questions, I like to give them a notification when the show goes live. I can schedule that in advance, and uh, it's a big time saver for me. And coupled with that, there's another one called Text Expander. It can pre-fill emails for you with and responses and then you customize a little bit also very helpful so i'm big into the email tools right now they've saved me a ton of time i love it i love it okay i'm gonna save you some money because right now i bet you're paying 50 bucks a month for the premium boomerang plan correct i'm not sure i just signed up for a couple weeks ago so i'm not oh sure. okay well it's using free now i'm up to the, the new one okay so if you go to mixmax.com it's a chrome extension for gmail and you can do all the things that boomerang does for free. Ooh, I'll have to check that out. So check it out. Um, very, very cool. Uh, great tip. Great tip. Scott Todd, what's your tip of the week? Okay. So, you know, we like to save time. We don't like to, and we like to save money too, right? So check out this website, Watcher, W-A-A-T-C-H-E-R. And basically you can take a, an Amazon URL for something that you want to buy on Amazon. And basically you can, you can set a target price and when Amazon drops the price to what you want to pay, it will automatically buy the item for you. <laughs> so, you know, when something goes on sale or you think it's going to go on sale and, and we all know that Amazon's prices, they swing just like anything else, supply and demand. So set your price that you're willing to pay and buy it at the strike price. It's like investing on your spending. Oh, that's a great tip. How'd you find this? Uh, I'm good, man. I'm good. You are good. Wow. That's really good. Huh. Son of a gun. All right. Well, my tip's better because my tip is going to get you out of debt, show you how to invest and all that good stuff. Go to scottallenturner.com and learn more. He's got a... a iTunes show, Google Play podcast, or he's got a podcast, um, resources, articles on making extra money, getting out of debt, budgeting, insurance, investing, personal finance, and even how to avoid scams. It's awesome. Go to scottallenturner.com. I will have a link to his site. Scott, are we good? Yeah, one last thing. I'm going to give you guys a special URL at my domain slash art. You listeners will be able to pick up a free audio version of my book, 99 Minute Millionaire. Oh, that's really generous. I love it. My second favorite word after automation. So scottallenturner.com forward slash art. Yes. A-R-T. Awesome. Awesome. Um, Scott Todd, are we good? We are good, Mark. All right. Well, I just want to remind the listeners, the only way we're going to get the quality of guests like a Scott Allen Turner to come on this podcast is if you do us three little favors. You got to subscribe, you got to rate, and you got to review the podcast. Send us a screenshot of the review to support at thelandgeek.com. We're going to send you for free 
the Passive Income Launch Kit. Again, today's podcast is sponsored by geekpay.io. Go ahead, send, sign up. We'll send you a, uh, a, a way to get a, a free demo and see if it's for you. Uh, start automating your payments. Uh, Scott, should we do it? Are you just, I think we just sign off gently, Mark. We're just going to sign off gently. Let freedom ring. ring. Thanks, everybody.